right, are we ready? Um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about uh, microservices. And uh, we at CircleCI are big believers in the blameless postmortem. If you're not familiar with blameless postmortems, the notion is effectively that you want to get everything out on the table. And so you take the people out of the equation and just discuss um, what happened, the process, and things that you could have done better, and, and use that as, as a great opportunity for learning. So in, in this subject today, I want to focus on what we learned as we went through a transition uh, from a monolith into microservices, and some of the places that we, uh, when we look back, could have done better to help you, depending on where you are in the cycle, either heading into this transition or even if you're deep into using microservices, understand some places that you could make some, hopefully, some improvements to how you work. Uh, in order to do this, I need to take a little bit of a step back and just help you understand CircleCI and, and how we got to here. So CircleCI is a, a continuous integration and continuous deployment platform. Um, we offer our service both in a cloud environment and uh, hosted on your own servers. Uh, in our cloud environment, we run about, I think we just broke 5 million builds a month. So uh, it's a pretty large platform. And we certainly didn't come out of the gate as a business uh, prepared to take on this kind of load. We've had to make a number of changes in our infrastructure and architecture over the years. Uh, we're about six years old at this point, a little over six years old. Um, and so uh, when, at the time that I joined, which was uh, the middle of 2014, CircleCI was built entirely as a monolith. Uh, it was the, the right solution to the problem at the time. We were still figuring out our business, um, and we basically use that single piece of code, this is the definition of a monolith, to do everything that we did to respond to web requests, to process jobs, to execute builds, to send notifications out uh, about those builds when they were complete. And this was great. We were able to move relatively quickly and, and get things done. But as we progressed, we started to hit really the limits of that, uh, that architecture. And so, uh, this is not actually a chart from Datadog, it's, but it's imprinted on my brain because I saw this uh, pretty regularly. And so what happened was as we grew, we got to a point where when we added additional capacity in the form of hosts, when we added more systems into our platform, we were actually able to run fewer builds. So this is what it looked like. As we scaled up, we were able to process fewer and fewer builds at any given time because of this monolithic architecture. So uh, basically, each system was thrashing on the queue, trying to take the next job that another system would take, and so a bunch of time was wasted, and we had to start thinking about uh, making some changes. And, and soon after that, in July of 2015, we had a pretty massive outage. Uh, it was 24 hours long. I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, and we started to realize a lot of the technical and architectural debt that we really needed to start addressing in our platform. So we, we started out incrementally. We made some small changes to, to buy ourselves some breathing room, some headroom. But as we did that, we realized we were headed on a path that was just incrementing towards a, a local maximum. And we needed to make some big, big changes. But as in particular, in our build engine, how we scheduled jobs and how we executed them. And so we had to take some time and think about how we could do that in a way that wasn't going to impact all of our customers as we started to do it. So, we wanted to create this seam effectively in, and split jobs between what we now call our 1.0 platform. No one thinks of their first platform as 1.0. Uh, and what we eventually called 2.0. And so as we started, we could run one build, two builds, three builds through this other build infrastructure. And of course, those logical blocks of API 1.0 result processing, that's actually just our existing monolith. So we, we created some seams. And this was where we really started to head into the world of microservices. Um, and to be honest, we didn't really have a plan. We had a couple really, really talented engineers, the kind of engineers where the best thing that you could do is just get out of their way. So we knew we could trust these engineers to figure out not just what our build engine should be and how it should work, but also how we should be going about building software in the future. And, uh, and they did a great job. The results were amazing. We had a um, you know, really big impact on the business. We were able to move quickly. And, uh, and they were able to really demonstrate some of the value that we could get out of moving into microservices. At the same time, our monolith was really starting to creak, just not only from an operational perspective, but from an engineering perspective. So as developers were working on that monolith, the, 
the projects were taking longer and longer, new engineers would come in, and just the work of learning the full context of the changes that you were going to make as it was spread throughout the monolithic code base was becoming a big problem. So seeing the difference between how things were working in the microservices world versus what we had achieved or what we were achieving in the monolith, in the monolith world, we said, okay, we should probably be thinking about doing more things as microservices. But we wanted to be cautious. We'd heard a lot of tales of poor decision making heading into microservices, and I had experienced this myself in a previous company where we didn't truly understand the business. So we created microservices to serve specific pieces of our architecture that ended up being the wrong pieces. And when you have the wrong pieces of your architecture split out into microservices, you just create a lot of overhead for yourself. Additionally, we truly understood the operational characteristics of our platform at this point. I mean, we're four to five years into our life cycle as a company. There's very low risk that we're gonna pivot into another business. We just are trying to scale this thing operationally and we're scaling our engineering teams. So we're good to go, right? Let's jump in and let's do this microservices thing. We've checked the boxes. So what happens? Immediately the wheels come off the wagon. Like it is absolute grinding to a halt in terms of our engineering productivity. And it's worth noting at this point that we are a CI and CD company. We spend every single day thinking about developer productivity, not just because we want our own engineering team to be productive, but because that is the service that we provide to all of our customers. So this isn't just a question of developer productivity and, and my own team. This is an identity crisis for us as a company because we thought we knew what we were doing and we think of ourselves as fairly intelligent people who think about this problem all the time. So um, I started to hear things like, this is too hard, we should just build this next feature in the monolith, but we knew all of the problems we were having in the monolith, so we really wanted to sit down and figure out where things had gone wrong. And one thing worth, uh, this is my favorite architecture diagram ever, but one thing that, that really came out in this process, and this is surely not about identifying what those services are, but it's the shaded region. When you build in a monolith, you come into work every day and work on business logic. You build features for your customers because the work of connecting to a database and exposing an HTTP stack and retrying bad calls over the network, somebody wrote that before you even showed up at this company. You don't think about that stuff ever. You just show up and work on business logic every day. And you're improving the functionality for your customers. Move over here to the, to the microservices world, and honestly, those shaded regions could probably be 75% of those services. You show up and you have a clean slate and you think, now I need to implement you know, an HTTP stack on the front of this thing, I need to worry about how I'm accessing the file system, my security protocols, my retries, et cetera, et cetera. So you've gone from you know, the small town comfort of working in the monolith and you've grown up and moved to the big city. And now there's this unfamiliar surrounding and you're trying to understand even how to make things work day to day. And so the amount of time that you can spend on that business logic is greatly, greatly reduced. So when we sat and thought about what we had done in throwing people into this new world, we identified three key sources of friction. And that was decision making, novelty, and repetition. I'm gonna to talk to you first about decision making. Oops. Um, so everyone is familiar with analysis paralysis, I think, and the notion that you could be faced with a decision that's so complex that you spend all this time and never really get to a decision, uh, either because there's too many choices or because the choices are too complicated, honestly. Um, but at a, at a higher level, there's just some overhead to needing to make a decision. And I think this is a great example um, of where we do this in software development. So in my third or fourth year of my software development career, I started working on a really large C project. It was, well, larger than this for sure. Um, and this was the code style that I showed up and saw, which, is, uh, which was super weird to me. And the great thing about being in your third or fourth year of your software development career is you don't really know anything except that you know everything. And so I had spent a lot of quality time arguing whether the opening brace or opening uh, yeah, curly brace should be at the end of the first line or the beginning of the second line, but I had never seen this indented with the next block kind of format. And so I thought, well, I need to go find the lead engineer, explain to him that this is wrong and we can reformat the code base because that's, that's high value. The good news 
for me was that I was actually super intimidated by this guy. I think I still would be if I ran into him again. And I totally revered him. So I thought maybe that he's doing something right and I just don't understand it. So why don't I just see if I can get my editor to indent brackets in this way? And of course I could because, well, I'm not going to tell you what editor I used. But uh, it was really easy. And all of a sudden, the concept of how I should format my code disappears into the background, and I start thinking about the code that I'm working on. And that, to me, is a very good example that we use all the time. I mean, I'm sure, I'll assume many of you out there have coding standards for your code bases so that you can focus on the things that really, really matter. So that's great in the small. What about moving into microservices? Why didn't we think that this was going to be a problem? Well, we made a bunch of decisions. We made some decisions early. So we are a closure shop. Uh, and so we said, it is not up in the air for you to decide in your service what language or stack you're going to use. You're going to use closure. We, everyone here knows it. It's treated us well. Let's not waste time on that. Um, we used gRPC as a communication protocol in our first services that we built in this 2.0 project. It was working really well. We said, consistency is great. Let's use gRPC. We're going to use Postgres as data storage. Uh, we're going to use Docker on top of Kubernetes for, for deploying our application. So that's a lot of important decisions that we made coming out of the gate, and we felt like we'd put real constraints on this process. Well, there are a lot of decisions to be made in software development, it turns out. And you can make them very, very differently. So uh, one example, we used to use a library called Schema, which if you're not a Clojure developer, you might not know. But it is effectively a typing system ish for enforcement of the shape of your data structures. Since that had come out and since CircleCI had used it, a similar set of patterns and tools had been introduced into the Clojure core language. And so one of our teams said, oh, this looks interesting. Maybe we should use that. Now I'm faced with a decision. Not only is it a decision that I have to make that would be great to just wipe off the table because it doesn't really matter. Uh, you could use either and you'd be fine. But suddenly you realize, oh, I need Clojure 1.8, not Clojure 1.7, which we've been using. So let's switch. But we have a bunch of libraries that have only ever been tested on 1.7. So let's spike out using this entire new change to our core infrastructure because we want to use a different library. And the value add of all of that work, again, compared to shipping features to your customers, is very, very low. So the key point that we took away from this was reduce your decision making to exceptions. Be very clear, and, and one thing I would highlight here is you can't come completely top down with these kinds of decisions. Because when you do that, people are just going to disregard your decisions anyway. So we actually got together a group. And uh, first, I walked them through um, Jeff Bezos' disagree and commit pattern, whatever you want to call it, mantra, which was basically, we as a group are going to agree to something. And if you don't personally agree with it, that's OK. You're still going to do it this way, because we are going to go focus on things that matter. And I, in particular, did not even have a vote. It was, you are the team. You're all very smart. You're all bright people. Whatever we decide on is going to be fine, but we need to make a decision and we need to get moving on the things that really, really matter. Novelty. Engineers love new stuff. Uh, and sometimes because the old stuff hasn't satisfactorily solved our problems. I totally get that. But many times, because it's new. We like to try new things. We like to learn new things, new technology, new stacks, whatever. And this is great. But if we were scientists, so I love this facial expression. I had to do like a screen capture from a moving video, so this is the one that I happened to get. I think this is the way Neil would look if he saw how many variables we change when we're testing something new. Like if you've ever gone through the scientific method, you generally try to isolate one independent variable. We, especially in the world of microservices, look, I have a clean slate. I can do all these things that I've always wanted to do, so let's change everything at once. This does not end well. Every single change compounds on top of the others to create basically an environment that you know nothing about. And then when you run into issues, you end up not knowing where to start. I mean, has anyone here ever been through the process of backing out three or 10 or whatever different changes to try to figure out the one that mattered, right? And you can't get bisect all of your technology stack. So, um, 
a couple examples of this, and, and actually, sorry, wh why we didn't think this mattered to us was we were adopting technology choices that actually we believed we were familiar with, if that can make any sense. But we, um, we used Mongo massively at Circle CI. Ever since 2011, we've been a Mongo shop, and we, uh, we run terabytes and terabytes, many, many different replica sets. We know it well, um, and we've been using it for a long time. But as we moved to microservices, we said, OK, this is an opportunity to go back to Postgres, which many of us prefer. We've had some interesting experiences with Mongo over the years. And so let's take this opportunity. And it's, it's Postgres. It's a relational database. Everybody knows about relational databases, right? Well, it turns out that we've actually been using Mongo for a really long time. And so engineers that have been working with us for a long time have been thinking and living, breathing the way that things work in Mongo. And it's sort of the devil that we know. And so switching to Postgres, something you learn very quickly is in Mongo, you really never lock anything. So you never have deadlocks. Deadlocks are a real thing. A relational database is a, is a powerful, powerful tool, but you need to understand how to use it. And so now we are helping engineers understand these new old tools that we're using versus, again, working on building business logic day to day. Uh, and I mentioned previously that we introduced Docker because we are moving to a services-based world. We have a bunch of different deployments. We want to make them consistent. Uh, and we, you know, we're deploying a lot of it. And we actually truly believe in Docker. I mean, I personally have worked on sort of the operations and system side of the house for a long time, maybe 20 years. And so uh, I truly believe that Docker is a game changer. It, it really handles a number of issues that I wished I could have handled for many years over the course of my career. But in introducing it, we also then brought it into every single developer's development environment. And so I, as a developer, instead of spinning up this single monolith and my Mongo instance and getting to work on writing code, uh, now need to manage a Docker environment, a Docker cluster, uh, if you will, or pod on my laptop and understand the interactions between those. And I'm not personally a systems engineer, and therefore I don't understand when I'm trying to debug that this thing has a network connection that's not working to that thing. And so my day-to-day -day job of just writing code is now encumbered with this new knowledge requirement. So, this seems like the obvious answer here, but take small steps. As I said, when we did the 2.0 project, we had a couple engineers. They were working on things very quickly, and they were isolated from the rest of the system. So as we discovered issues, we were able to tackle those issues and figure out how to get around them. But with that, I would advise investing in them. Because when you realize, hey, this is an issue for me, it's going to be an issue for other people. So you need to actually stop and make an investment in how you're going to tool that for broader use. Because when we went from one small project to basically all projects, um, everyone was trying to solve these things independently and running into the exact same issues. The other thing we did after this, coming back to the, the knowledge of, of systems, is we recognized that communication is very, very effective inside a team and less effective between teams. So we took uh, the folks that we have within our organization who were in a standalone SRE team and distributed them directly into the teams responsible for delivery so that there was someone with the right skill set, now all the way from front end JavaScript development down to SRE, someone with the right skill set in your team whose objective is the same as your objective, the objective of delivering this piece of functionality and capability to our end users, as opposed to the objective of, I don't know, resisting change or whatever. And so that alignment has them sitting next to you to help you understand how to debug this environment, or maybe building better tools for that environment so that it works effectively for everyone in the team with that aligned goal. OK. So last, repetition. We've all heard it. Don't repeat yourself. Hopefully you read this book, maybe in 1999, maybe more recently. But in 1999, Andrew Hunt and David Thomas taught us this expression, dry. 
And uh, in the same year, Martin Fowler wrote his refactoring book, which was uh, a basically how to break down your code, find patterns, code smells, and retool them appropriately. And if you look at the list of patterns that he identifies or code smells, as he refers to them in that book, the very first one is duplication. And so this is something we've been talking about for a really long time. Um, our IDEs, if you happen to use one, have built-in functions to refactor our code, to extract out common code, to simplify it down, take out the one difference, and make that into a single point. And so we do this very, very well in the small, right? We understand how to take our code and eliminate all the duplication and all the overhead of that duplication, and we've learned where those things are going to fail us. So I sort of wish that there would be a 2017 reissue edition of one of these books that doesn't require much difference, just has a little asterisk maybe that says, also applies to microservices. Because we haven't figured out yet how to apply these patterns in a distributed system. So we didn't think this was going to be a problem going in, like everything else, because we thought people would talk to each other. And we thought, OK, if someone is working on a problem that they identify and someone else is working on that, a similar problem, they will somehow find each other and uh, express that way, it does make it sound like an insane idea. But they will find each other, and they will talk about that problem, and they will come up with a common solution. And this makes a lot of sense. The, the telephone uh, is important here because we actually do have a fairly distributed team. Uh, we have a lot of remote folks, which, which does create some additional um, reduced likelihood that I'm just going to bump into you and say, hey, I'm working on this thing. Oh, I'm working on that same thing. Maybe we should get together and find a common solution. So, uh, I mentioned gRPC previously as a, a tool that we introduced. Um, we, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a basically an open source version of a, a Google protocol for using um, protocol buffers over HTTP2 as a mechanism for communication between services. One thing about being a closure shop is uh, nobody builds the closure library for their new tooling first. And uh, the, the gRPC tooling is great in Java, but you know, there's nothing wrapped around it for um, foreclosure. And so uh, the other thing I would say about closure developers is they're very opinionated, which is okay. Uh, it's, you could probably strike closure from that sentence and it would still be true. But they have an aesthetic that they appreciate. And, um, and so no one liked doing, uh, actually, it's worth explaining that you have access to the JVM from inside of Clojure. So the Java library gets us most of the way, but you have to write interop code to talk to the Java library. And uh, we decided, we, an engineer, decided that it would be great to wrap the way in which we talk to those Java libraries to, in Clojure so that there was a nice, easy way to access it in sort of more idiomatic Clojure style. And that's great, except that Three engineers made that same decision and each independently wrote their own library to deal with gRPC. And then that's two engineers worth of time already being spent. Then we went and realized that and took it back into those other two places and consolidated on one, which is another layer of work that's not the work that you're trying to do to get uh, business functionality in front of your customers. Also, I mentioned moving to Postgres. Um, so this is kind of fun. I, I uh, unfortunately don't get to write a lot of code anymore, or, or fortunately. It's fortunate for everyone else. It's not as fortunate for me. And, um, but every once in a while, I like to skim PRs and just kind of see what's going on. And um, especially as we're making this transition, I mean, I do care a lot about how we are building things and whether or not we're being effective in our building. And so. It's late at night, and I'm skimming through some PRs, and I find uh, an implementation in one of our new services of basically talking to Postgres, you know, setting up the connections, configuring um, basically where, where the Postgres instance is, and handling retries and stuff like that. 
And uh, most of it is deferred to an external library. And so it's, we'll call it 10 lines of code. But it's 10 lines of code that's in this one service. And I think to myself, this is going to end badly. But if you're in engineering management, if you're a CTO, VP Eng, whatever, wherever you might be in the management structure, even probably a, you know, just a senior engineer with some experience, this is a really hard part of your job, which is having the conversation that goes something like, you're doing this thing and it's going to end badly. And the obvious question, well, how is it going to end badly? And the only answer you have is, I don't know yet. I'll know it when I see it. And it is going to end badly. Well, why are you micromanaging me? Why are you micromanaging me right now? I, I'm not. I'm just trying to help future you have a better time. You're helping present me have a really bad time. Could you just change it anyway? So then, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning or whatever it is. I'm reading this PR. I envision this entire conversation. I'm really tired, and I think it's fine. It's ten lines of code. We'll clean it up later. Obviously, I'm, I mean, I'm up here telling you the story. I think you know where it's going to go. And so uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we have a, a cloud version, a cloud offering, and then we have a server offering. And so we are eight days-ish from uh, launching the incorporation of all of these new services into our server-hosted uh, version of our product. And it turns out that in the server offering, we have more configurations of how you can run Postgres than we do in our cloud offering, because we have one cloud offering, but different people want to deploy in different ways on the server side. And it also turns out that the other way is not accounted for in each of the services that has hand-coded its Postgres connection. And it's all somewhat centrally managed, but they all handle the central management differently. So now four or five, I don't remember the exact number, teams not only need to go find these lines of code and find a way to solve it, they each need to solve it differently because their implementation is different. And they each need to stop what they're doing because this was written months ago. They need to stop what they're doing on whatever they're trying to deliver right now and go back and re-implement their handling of a Postgres connection. A Postgres connection is not very exciting. It's not moving the needle for your customers. I mean, if you didn't have a connection, that would be a problem for your customers, but it's not the thing that they're excited about in your product. And so implementing it five different ways so you have to go back and fix it five different ways is pure overhead. It has nothing to do with the value that you're trying to deliver to your, to your customers. So the key learning that we took out of this particular situation and others like it is that you really do need to have shared components, uh, but they need two things with them. One is you actually need to recognize the investment and create ownership so people know I am responsible for this shared library. I'm going to build the thing that talks to Postgres, and I'm going to provide it to other teams building services, and time. So you need to say, OK, we're building microservices. We are going to invest in all of the tooling that's going to help our teams be successful at building their microservices, at focusing on the things that they really know how to do, and taking away the things that are either going to be a big learning for them or a, a big repetition of what everyone else is doing. So uh, we effectively created a team. Uh, it's called the backplane team, and I'll let you go look up, uh, I don't know, how blade servers are architected, which apparently no one knows about anymore. But uh, take a look at them. You'll understand what a backplane is. It's all the shared components, all the pieces that basically make your piece really, really simple. And that's all they work on. So it's not like someone in one of these services teams says, oh, I need this thing, and everyone else must need it, so I'm going to build it and support it, because now I'm not working on my service. When that happens, if you don't identify within your, within your application, your platform, your organization, the areas that you were expecting to get built and create space and time and ownership for them to get built, they'll get built anyway. They'll just get built really poorly. So we talked about creating alignment by putting people in teams because communication within teams is generally more successful. 
And this is great, but at some point, you need communication across teams. So um, we took the time to create uh, what we call guilds, which is basically out of the, the Spotify model. I don't even know if that's still their model, but they wrote some great blog posts and put up some videos about how their model worked a while back, which is cross-team uh, coordination around areas of capability, really, and expertise. And so SRE, which has now moved into delivery teams, is a guild. And they all talk to each other on a very regular basis, sort of monthly, uh, or sorry, weekly meeting that anyone else can come to if they're interested. Um, and then same thing for front end, which is you know, the, the single page application development. And then same thing in our services. So when I'm working on that gRPC library, or I'm facing problems in how to do my database connections, there are other people doing the same thing, and we actually surface it so we can centralize that work. All right, this is a, a look in the rear view mirror, except it's 2017, so I guess we all have you know, backup cameras now. Um, the big question in all of this is, is, was it worth it? Was this the right thing? Did we make the right decision about nine months ago when we headed down this path? And the answer for me is a resounding yes. Absolutely. Um, and drawn to scale, I, I used a ruler, actually, if you believe it, uh, to draw this diagram. But you know, I talked previously about how we created additional capacity, and we couldn't utilize it. We actually got lower and lower consumption of that capacity. And so that, system, that, that symptom has gone away. Not only that, the, um, the blue line there, that's where it tipped over before. And so we're running uh, these days at about five times that utilization of the platform uh, and growing solidly. And all of those operational concerns uh, have disappeared. And we're seeing the same effects in terms of our actual delivery. So we're at the point now, after getting through some of these things and making some of these changes in our organization, that we really are feeling the impact and the effects of, of shifting to a microservices model. But it, you should all think about this for yourselves. I don't know if anyone is a Cat Stevens fan, or maybe you just saw Guardians of the Galaxy 2. It's on the soundtrack. Anyway, um, father and son, this song is a great example to me of someone who's been through something trying to explain it to someone who hasn't. Like, yes, it's easy for me to say, oh, these are all the things that we learned, and these are the experiences that we had. But um, the reality is you need to think about yourself and about what matters for you, and whether this is the right path to go on. Uh, but if you choose to, and if this is the path that you're on, or if you're deep into this, I can at least summarize the key things that we took away from this. Said it before, I'll say it again. Take small steps. Identify individual changes and make them, make them consciously, and take the time to invest when you make them. Share early. Create that clear ownership, but also do it out of the gate. Recognize, as you're taking those steps, the investments that you need to make to ensure that you maintain your velocity. And this is uh, one of the things that I really wish we had known going into this. I talked about um, understanding our business model, understanding our operational characteristics, and really believing that we'd, we'd been through the checklist of cautions in moving to microservices, but the thing that we weren't, hadn't really thought through because it hadn't been identified to us, was recognizing that this was going to be an investment. That if we wanted to continue moving at the pace that we were moving, we were going to have to invest in things that typically look like an engineering project, not a product project delivering value to customers. But that leverage is key when you're breaking up into microservices. So if you're not in an organization that can have a healthy conversation about that investment, then this might, might, might not be the right step to take. Minimize communication dependencies. Again, you need to make a decision in your organization about where you want the fast paths of communication to be. Uh, Conway, we talk about all the time. Uh, it really is going to have an impact on how you build and where your successes are going to be. So think about that a lot. But then make sure you do your best to get that cross-team communication, too. We love the notion of microservices being an opportunity for complete autonomy. You go build your service in your little locked room, I'll go build my service in my little locked room, and maybe we'll share an API spec and nothing else. And this might be right for you, depending on the scale of your organization, but at the scale of our organization, 
we're about 30 software developers. This does not make sense. We need to have clear communication paths so that we can get those points of leverage in sharing. And then reduce decisions to exceptions. Get together early, decide how you're gonna do things. Obviously, I'm pushing for as much commonality and sharing as possible, but make that decision and only choose to do other things when that decision completely fails you. Don't choose MySQL because I like it better. Choose MySQL, actually don't choose MySQL if you're using Postgres, there's no good reason. But maybe you need a graph database to solve a very specific problem. Also think you probably don't, talk to me after if you wanna hear about graph databases. But only choose to even think about alternatives if you truly can't make the path that you've set work. Because every new thing you introduce is gonna be overhead and every time you stop to evaluate, that's work that you shouldn't be doing because you could be delivering functionality to your customers. And then finally, iterate. So nine months ago, we sort of embarked on this journey and, uh, and we thought we were right. We thought we had the right organization in place. We thought we knew what we were doing. We, we looked at these particular problems that we thought we might run into and, and we thought we were gonna handle them. So we've done a lot to change over that time We've created a new organizational structure. We've thought about how we take on problems differently. But the most important thing that I think we've taken out of that is that our architecture is constantly changing. We have become very good as a community at iterating on the software that we build, right? We try to get very early feedback. We use Circle CI for our CI and CD. We get stuff in front of customers very quickly. We learn and we iterate. But if we don't do that with our organization, then our, our software will continue to move in new directions and we won't be aligned with it anymore. So it's not about a, setting up your organization in a way that matches what you do today. It's about setting up your organization in a way that can respond to the ever-changing state of your software and architecture. Thank you very much.